Otolaryngology has a long and rich tradition of endoscopic removal of tracheobronchial foreign bodies. Chevalier Jackson, the father of this technique, pioneered its use in the early part of this century. Many instruments were developed and techniques refined at his Jackson Clinic. We use his principles and indeed some of the same instruments he and his colleagues developed in modern tracheobronchial foreign body removal. Modern refinements in technology, anesthesia, diagnosis, and treatment have made this a safe procedure when undertaken by skilled and well-trained endoscopists. This program will demonstrate an effective approach to the diagnosis and removal of foreign bodies in an effort to improve the care of patients afflicted with this life-threatening problem. Removal of foreign bodies from the aerodigestive tract has evolved in three main areas. New diagnostic techniques in radiology permit more accurate identification of objects and their location. Safer anesthetic agents and techniques allow better monitoring of patients during foreign body removal. Improved instrumentation permits easier visualization and safer removal of objects during endoscopy. It also provides a means to ventilate the patient with a bronchoscope in place. We're going to take a listen with our little microphone, okay? Aspiration of foreign bodies into the aerodigestive tract is responsible for many deaths in the United States each year, most of them in children under two years old. Patients who survive the acute stage present even the most experienced endoscopist with a challenge in diagnosis and treatment. Kids with foreign bodies can really present as uh, almost any clinical picture uh, that you can think of in terms of upper respiratory problems, and that's what really makes foreign body sometimes a difficult situation to diagnose for a lot of uh, primary care physicians. Children, as you well know, get uh, frequent upper respiratory infections, uh, cough, uh, wheezing sometimes from bronchitis, asthma, and so forth. And all of these symptoms can be also found in foreign body in ingestion or aspiration. So I think that uh, you have to be prepared in the back of your mind when you're assessing any child with a chronic respiratory problem. Uh, you also always have to be prepared in the back of your mind that a foreign body may be the root of the difficulty. The most effective approach to the care of these patients is a team effort. This team consists of an endoscopist, radiologist, and anesthesiologist, all of whom should be experienced in dealing with this problem. By working together, diagnosis is made quickly and the object removed safely. Hi, Mrs. Lola. How Hi, are, are you? I'm Dr. Healy. Critical to the diagnosis is an accurate history. Determine if the patient has any breathing difficulties or problems with eating and swallowing. Have there been episodes of wheezing, coughing, or choking? Is there a history of unexplained recurrent pneumonia, respiratory illness, or other conditions which do not respond to appropriate medical management? Well, a couple of days ago... Did the patient uh, have access to any small objects which may have been placed in the mouth? And he coughed, and he coughed, and he coughed, and he coughed, but it seemed to subside. By necessity, the history often comes from the parent. Unfortunately, important historical information may be overlooked or underappreciated. Tell me a little bit about the actual situation. I think it's very important to listen to the parents. And parents who live with these kids day in, day out, seven days a week, 365 days a year, are very adept at picking up subtle changes in their child. And I think what sometimes happens is parental concerns in this regard are overlooked. Perhaps he's got a little bit of a cough now that he's never had before. Even though he doesn't cough every night, or he doesn't cough frequently during the week, it's some little subtle change that they're uncomfortable with. Now the difficulty is that the most common cause of these kinds of symptoms are still colds and viruses and upper respiratory infections of the good old-fashioned variety. And when you're a primary care physician, seeing 500 of these cases a month with colds, coughs, and upper respiratory infections, that it is easy to overlook and think about foreign body when in, in any individual practice uh, of primary care type medicine, you may not see more than one of these every few years. But the story may well be classic. The child is playing and suddenly the mother realizes that he has a choking episode or a violent coughing episode. And then subsequent to that, things change. 
he starts wheezing or he has uh, or a productive cough or he, uh, he's just not the same as he was before. So some of these little nuances in their story will be a tip-off to the, uh, either the primary care physician or to the specialist if the patient ends up in our office that in fact we should be at least thinking about foreign body as a possibility in the diagnosis. Patients often present with symptoms leading to various erroneous diagnoses, such as asthma, pneumonia, or allergy. Recurrent or migratory pneumonia and other unexplained persistent respiratory symptoms in a child should always raise suspicion of a retained foreign body. Uh, there are certain tip-offs that the specialist who deals with these conditions and these problems frequently looks for when assessing uh, a child that's been sent for consultation. Uh, for example, we're always suspicious of the child who's having recurrent pneumonia, especially if the recurrent pneumonia is always in one area of the lung, say the right middle lobe. Uh, that frequently worries us that perhaps there's something obstructing that specific location or that specific bronchus, uh, frequently what is seen in foreign objects. The second thing that bothers us is uh, a diagnosis of atypical asthma. And we see kids sometimes uh, sent to us with, please evaluate for atypical wheezing or atypical asthma. And what you learn as you take the history or read the, uh, the report of the referring physician is that the wheezing is frequently only in one lung. Well, asthma usually doesn't affect just one area of the lungs. It usually is a diffuse disease of affecting the whole respiratory system. So we're always suspicious when someone has unusual asthma. And then uh, children who, uh, who have wheezing, uh, which again is confined to one location, uh, a, is not a typical finding in children with uh, uh, bronchoconstrictive disease, such as uh, asthma and so forth. So again, another tip-off. This is the doctor's microphone. You want to say hi to me on it? The history should be accompanied by a careful physical examination. <laughs> Disparate breath sounds signify differences in air movement between the right and left side of the chest. Asymmetry frequently indicates the presence of a foreign body. This should be confirmed later by x-ray. I don't think there are any squirrels living in there at all. Occasionally, a child presents with an object impacted high in the esophagus. Upper esophageal foreign bodies may produce laryngeal irritation or respiratory distress, leading one to believe the obstruction is respiratory in origin. The esophagus and the trachea are so intimately related, especially in young children, being only separated by a very thin muscular wall, that it, it is uh, not unlikely for an object lodged in the esophagus, especially in the upper part of the esophagus, to impinge by either inflammation, swelling, etc., or by its actual size on the back wall of the trachea, thus producing respiratory symptoms. Open Dysphagia may be a later finding, but its absence should not lower suspicion. Symptoms may include pain, regurgitation of undigested food, or increased salivation. However, remember that the absence of these symptoms does not rule out the possibility of an esophageal foreign body. build up in the lung behind the object. So it looks like he has a check Following the history and physical examination, obtain a radiologic evaluation to help identify the object and determine its location. Plain x-rays of the neck and chest are basic diagnostic tools and frequently constitute the complete examination. If the diagnosis is in doubt, fluoroscopy permits further evaluation of the dynamics of respiration. Most of the time, in the evaluation of a child with a foreign body, the only things that are required are plain radiographs. If the child is able to, to cooperate, then uh, we try and do inspiratory and expiratory views of the chest, and that typically allows us to identify the location of the foreign body. It's important to, to realize that there are three different scenarios that can happen with a foreign body. In about 1% of cases, the foreign body causes no obstruction to airflow in the, uh, the affected bronchus. So in that situation, the x-rays are normal both in inspiration and expiration. Uh, when you have a child that has a, uh, a check valve phenomenon, that's where the uh, foreign body causes obstruction during expiration only. And as the child takes a deep breath in, 
it allows the bronchus increases in size and allows air to go in, but it traps the air behind the foreign body. So during inspiration, the lungs can actually look pretty normal. But when the child exhales, the affected lung is, has trapped air behind it. So the normal lung deflates, the affected lung is, uh, air is trapped in that lung, and you can tell the difference. The heart shifts to the side away from the abnormal lung as well. When you have a ball valve phenomenon, that happens in about 20% of the cases. The uh, obstructing foreign body completely obstructs the bronchus so that air in the affected lung is uh, resorbed after a while and you have post-obstructive atelectasis. So during inspiration, the normal lung inflates, but the affected lung cannot. So the diaphragm rises on the affected side, there's a shift of the heart towards the affected side, and the differences in inflation are much more striking. Most of the time, um, all that's necessary are plain films, either during inspiration or expiration. Now, in, if a child is unable to cooperate, if it's a young child uh, or an infant, then we do decubitus views of the, the chest. Normally, the down lung, in the n normal down lung deflates, but in a child that has an obstructed lung, when it, the, the abnormal lung is placed in a dependent position, it can't deflate, so it stays um, large and inflated. And then on occasion, uh, we need to take the child to the fluoroscopy suite and look at all of the findings that you would look for on an inspiration expiration series in real time. So we can look at the child during fluoroscopy and often tape it so we can identify more subtle abnormalities. The, the most recent advances in, in imaging have been in the use of computed tomography and CT for evaluating children that have very subtle radiographic findings. Because the CT looks at the uh, cross-sectional image of the chest, it can often identify either subtle or incomplete narrowing of the bronchi related to a foreign body. So more often now we're doing CT scans in children as, a, as an alternative imaging uh, study. But still the, the, the mainstay of diagnosis is uh, plain film radiography. Once the diagnosis of foreign body aspiration is suspected, the burden of proof of its presence or absence is on the endoscopist. A complete examination of the aerodigestive tract should be undertaken, preferably with the patient under general anesthesia. The method of choice for foreign body removal is rigid instrumentation with continuous control of the airway. Sometimes uh, secretions build up in the lung behind the object. It is important and, uh, to discuss the findings, the recommended treatment, and associated risks with the parents before attempting the now, extraction. Do you have any questions? If old enough to understand, well, also cases, tell the child about the procedure and what to expect. So, uh, this helps create a climate of cooperation and makes the endoscopy that much easier. Make sure there are no other objects in the, in the airway. Uh, did they have any anesthesia before at any time? In addition, the anesthesiologist should explain the anesthesia and address parental questions and concerns. Care must always be taken not to stress the patient who presents with adequate pulmonary ventilation. I think it's very important to realize that most patients who arrive at the hospital are in what we call a favorable situation. If they've aspirated a foreign object and completely occlude their airway, usually they don't make it to the hospital. But those that get here, which are the majority of patients, uh, are ventilating their lungs, and we do not want to take that situation and create an unfavorable situation out of it. Uh, now, how do you create an unfavorable situation? Well, in a small child, frequently by separating them from their mother, getting them frightened or anxious, uh, sticking them with needles to draw blood or start IV lines. All of these things really are not necessary. So we like to manipulate the patient as little, po as, little as possible, keep them calm, don't make them anxious, don't increase their oxygen need, and don't increase their anxiety. thought would be that it's probably a peanut. Prior to the procedure, the endoscopist and anesthesiologist should evaluate all pertinent radiographs and study the characteristics of the suspected foreign body. I think discussion with the anesthesiologist is extremely important because the endoscopist and the anesthesiologist are competing for the same space, namely the airway. 
So the anesthesiologist really needs to know what my difficulty is going to be. How, how do I expect to have to extract this object? What are the problems I'm going to run into? And on the other hand, I need to know what are the difficulties he or she is going to have in keeping the patient properly oxygenated, oxygenated and asleep. So we need to communicate so there's no change in plan in midstream unless it's vitally necessary for the safety of the patient. This makes for a more efficient extraction in a shorter time frame with good safety for the patient. Foreign bodies located in the tracheobronchial tree should always be removed with rigid instruments. Recent developments in instrumentation have greatly improved our ability to provide safe, effective treatment. For example, rigid bronchoscopes are available with a thin wall construction. This provides a large internal lumen size, but a small external diameter. A built-in channel permits simultaneous suction and can serve as a conduit for small instrumentation during the procedure. Even with the telescope in place, the anesthesiologist can control ventilation without disturbing the surgeon. Since a distal light source may become blocked by blood or secretions, it is useful to have an adjustable proximal prismatic light deflector which does not compromise the size of the lumen or restrict ventilation when using the bronchoscope as an open tube system. It is imperative that the endoscopist has a complete selection of appropriate endoscopes available. This includes a full range of laryngoscopes, bronchoscopes, and esophagoscopes in sizes appropriate for both the neonate and older child. Rigid endoscopes are preferred for foreign body removal because they are easier to manipulate than flexible scopes and a wider selection of extraction forceps are available. Three bronchoscopes should be readied, one in the anticipated correct size for the patient, one larger and one smaller. Improved telescopes and light sources provide better visualization than was previously available. The result is optical systems with good illumination, magnification and wide angle views. A video camera makes it even easier for the surgeon to operate in a comfortable position with an unobstructed view. Finally, advances in forcep technology greatly facilitate foreign body removal. The endoscopist must be familiar with the wide variety that is available. For example, optical forceps provide better control at the operative site than the more traditional open tube and forceps approach. Their increased magnification enlarges the viewing area and brings the focus closer. This is particularly helpful in small patients. Appropriate extraction forceps are readied. Sometimes the nature of the foreign body is not confirmed preoperatively or a second object is encountered during endoscopy. Therefore, the correct forceps may have to be chosen during the procedure. The optical forceps have really been a very big advance for us because they allow the surgeon to couple both telescopic magnification with the actual instrument that's going to remove the object. For example, in a peanut, where the peanut forceps are shaped in such a manner as to encompass the peanut itself and allow adequate extraction through the bronchoscope, we can put the telescope right into the same instrument, visualize and extract all in one maneuver. Occasionally, the uh, optical forceps are too large to fit into the bronchoscope that we may use on a smaller child. In this situation, we have a straight peanut forceps, which have the same cylindrical shape at the end, but have no telescopic attachment. This allows us to just encompass the peanut and extract it more by tactile sense than anything else uh, through the bronchoscope. The ball bearing forceps really got its name from its shape. Uh, and this uh, instrument really is useful in, in extracting any spherical object, not just ball bearings. BBs, uh, pieces of earrings, piece of mom's necklace, uh, any type of sp spherical object will uh, be very nicely extracted by these forceps. The alligator forceps really are useful in many different types of foreign bodies. Uh, they're particularly useful in straight objects such as common pins, uh, small tacks, nails, uh, pieces of a broken paper clip, uh, but actually anything that we can latch onto, and this frequently is the case in, in funny shaped toys or pieces of toys that will allow us to engage the, uh, the object and extract it uh, through the bronchoscope or at the tip of the bronchoscope. Uh, the open safety pin presents the endoscopist with a particularly difficult problem, especially if the presenting end is the open end. In this case, the object cannot be extracted through the bronchoscope because it will impact itself on the wall of the bronchus. So we really have to close the safety pin and then extract it. And here we see the 
safety pin forceps, which is placed through the scope uh, around the safety pin, and then the safety pin is closed uh, and extracted. If an object has been in the airway for some time, frequently the patient will develop granulation tissue. And this causes the endoscopist some difficulty because it bleeds, it's very friable, and frequently obscures the object. So in those circumstances, we like to remove it, uh, get it as free or as far away from the object as possible so that we can get a good visualization of what we must remove. Uh, the cup forceps are very useful for this purpose, allowing us to take small pieces of the uh, granulation tissue away from the foreign body. Occasionally this isn't good enough, and or we'll stir up some bleeding with the removal of the granulation tissue. And we find that the small suction catheter, which can be passed down the side arm of the bronchoscope, is useful for two purposes. One, irrigation to clear away blood, and number two, to provide continuous suction to suction away the blood as we visualize the object. In very rare occasions, we have so much granulation tissue that it's, it's almost impossible to remove it with the, uh, with the cup forceps. In those circumstances, we have found that a small electrode called the Bugby electrode, which is frequently used by urologists, uh, can be passed down the side arm of the bronchoscope and used to coagulate uh, while keeping the telescope in place to give good visualization coagulate the granulation tissue and get it removed from the area of the foreign body. Three, three, five, and four. Room preparation is a cooperative effort between the medical and nursing staff. However, ultimately, it is the physician's responsibility to make sure everything is ready, in place, and working properly. The endoscopist surveys the equipment, examines the bronchoscopes, makes sure there is a working light source and suction with backups for each and checks that the forceps likely to be needed are available and working. Okay, I think we're all set. Good. When all equipment is ready and the plan of action is set, induction of general anesthesia begins. Using a slow, careful mask induction technique minimizes patient manipulation. When the patient reaches a satisfactory depth of anesthesia, place an intravenous line while maintaining spontaneous respirations. Place a roll under the shoulders and hyperextend the head. In some patients, the reverse Trendelenburg position may facilitate endoscopy. The patient's position is extremely important to assure both an adequate examination and the comfort of the endoscopist. Be sure to protect the patient's gingiva and teeth as endoscopy proceeds. Eye protection should also be provided. Apply topical anesthesia to the pharynx and larynx using a 0.5% xylocaine solution. Use an oximeter to monitor ventilation. If the foreign body is in the esophagus, secure the airway before undertaking esophagoscopy. Because endoscopy involves potential exposure to blood and other body fluids, universal precautions must be observed. Following anesthesia, foreign body extraction follows three steps, inspection, extraction, and reinspection. First, inspect the pharynx and larynx to make sure they are clear. Although unusual, it is possible for an object to become dislodged and move during the time period between physical examination, radiologic examination, and endoscopy. Therefore, this step is important even when earlier tests have indicated no obstruction in this area. If no objects are present, carefully insert the appropriate sized ventilating bronchoscope. Inspect the trachea. If the trachea is clear, inspect the right and left bronchi and all subdivisions. Sometimes foreign bodies move from the position originally seen on radiography. This might happen, for example, if the patient coughs, moving the object to the opposite lung. In addition, sometimes a second non-radiopaque object is discovered during endoscopy that was not seen on the x-ray. Therefore, it is important to check the entire airway for presence of foreign bodies. When the object is located, note its position, particularly the orientation of pointed ends. Be very careful not to dislodge the object or move it peripherally. Examine the object and its relationship to surrounding structures. Determine if the object can be extracted through the bronchoscope or if it is too large. In either case, insert the appropriate forceps. Under visual control, carefully grasp the object. If it will fit through the bronchoscope, remove it while continuing ventilation. If the object is larger than the diameter of the scope, 
use the forceps to bring it to the tip of the bronchoscope. Then extract the bronchoscope and the foreign body as a unit. Be sure to alert the anesthesiologist before the actual extraction so the patient's level of anesthesia can be kept deep enough to avoid laryngospasm and permit continuous ventilation. With experience, one will gain facility in removing odd-shaped and sharp foreign bodies in a manner which avoids extensive mucosal damage to the tracheobronchial tree. Once the object is removed, re-inspect the airway to rule out the possibility of a second foreign body. Suction out any secondary secretions encountered and take cultures of this material. At this point, many endoscopists inspect the esophagus to make sure there are no objects there. Remember that an object lodged high in the esophagus often creates symptoms of respiratory distress. Therefore, any child suspected of having an airway foreign body who undergoes a negative laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy must have a complete examination of the esophagus to rule out this possibility. Postoperatively, the patient should be put in a humidified atmosphere for several hours. This helps expel secretions until the ciliary function is restored. A seven-day course of antibiotics should be prescribed. Cortisone may be ordered if edema of the bronchi is present. Sometimes, chest physical therapy is warranted to help raise secretions. Finally, a post-operative chest x-ray should be taken to make sure there is no atelectasis. Sophisticated anesthesia techniques and new instrumentation have really revolutionized endoscopic removal of foreign body in children. The optical forceps, telescopes, fiber optics, and the like have really made the, uh, the changes that we've looked for. Uh, I think, however, one must realize that there are no shortcuts in treating these patients. And all the vigilance that's always been maintained must still be maintained in dealing with these patients. The removal of foreign bodies from the tracheobronchial tree is an art form requiring diligence, skill, and experience. The principles set forth by Dr. Jackson, including the availability and proper use of appropriate equipment, still hold true today. Careful preparation by an experienced team is key to the procedure's success. There are no shortcuts. For as Dr. Paul Hollinger said many years ago, it is better to spend two hours preparing for two minutes than the reverse. <laughs>